Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, I guess, depends on whereabouts in the world you currently are. Um, we are live this evening. However, it seems like there may have been a minor technical glitch on the timing for some people, so just waiting for the rest of the gang to join um, for the live show today. If you would like to dial in, jump in on the conversation. Um, so for during the live broadcast, there's the dial in number. I guess it really only applies to people in North America. Although if you want to dial in from anywhere else, you're more than welcome to. Feel free to dial in, ask any questions you may have. Um, yeah, and see how it's going from there. Uh, Tanati, unfortunately, I don't think will be joining us today. Um, that's it right now. <laughs> it's a little thin on the ground. We're just waiting for the rest of the gang to get here. Um, so, in the interim, while we wait for other people to come along, um, I have a couple of I have a couple of questions a project I am working on where it would be really cool to get some help and some feedback or some assistance with the project. Um, I'm looking to build a classification model to help identify problems in such as uh, powdery mildew, detritus, spider mites, thrips, etc. Um, but to do that, I need to accumulate photographs that are known to be pictures of exactly what they are. So in other words, are they pictures, you know, I need pictures that are of powdery mildew where it's known that that's powdery mildew with spider mites it's known that it's spider mites it's uh, guaranteed that that's what they are um, if anybody's interested in, in getting involved in helping to source the, the imagery that would be really really appreciated um, the app idea at the end of the day is that the thing is free the service is free people can upload pictures and get them analyzed and get some hints or some tips and feedback on what might be the problem um, and then, yeah, hopefully to be able to take it from there and extend that to be able to do more. You know, we can start to have it do nutrient deficiency analysis, for instance, um, combine it with the weather charts and the analytics from, from the environment to be able to get a really good, accurate diagnosis of what the problem might be. So, yeah. Um, and by the way, if anybody would like to jump in on the meeting and jump in the conversation other than the dial-in, I can also put out the actual meeting link. If you use Chrome, you should be able to... Oh, thanks, Dave. <laughs> Move closer to the mic. All right, let me try and turn up the game. Yeah, it's a new... A new microphone. I don't know, is that better? Let me know. But yeah, that's a link. If you're using Google Chrome, you're welcome to jump in. Um, just a word of warning, it does use whatever your Google login details are. Ooh. Erich, how are you doing? Good, how about you? Very good, thanks. Very good. Is that, is my microphone loud enough? Sorry, I've just been chatting away and somebody on the chat said... Um, no, you're good. Time. It's it's perfect on my end. All right, cool. Yeah, no, I was just uh, trying out... Oh, my daughter's away. I went down and grabbed the... <laughs> um, Grabbed her microphone. <laughs> so, nice. She uses it. Use it. Probably got a better one, huh? 
Yeah, apparently so. Well, she uses it for Twitch streaming, so I'm assuming it's a decent-ish microphone. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So, yeah, how things been with you, sir? Good. Just busy still. Always doing something in the garden, but but going good. I actually still have some bobsled growing, so I'm just letting it letting it go to see what it does. The last small little, you know, bottom buds and stuff, which are actually filling out pretty nice. Everything's turned like a really dark, deep purple, so cool. Kind of interesting. Yeah, and by the sounds of it, um, you're going to have to need to keep an eye open for um, some hermiting, by the, from what I can gather. Yeah, that's it definitely. And actually, the uh, the one that I found, I ended up chopping two completely down, and I still have four of them going. The two that I chopped down were, one of them was one that I did find a few seeds inside of. And the other one I wasn't 100% sure about. I don't know if it got somewhat pollinated from the other one or what, but I chopped it down to be safe. So hopefully, yeah, the other ones don't end up herming while they're sitting there finishing off. But I haven't noticed anything else yet on, on the four that are still going, so. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, no, and it, it looks like for the next run, um, yeah, I think we'll use uh, Canna Queen. Yeah, that, that sounds cool. Yeah. I've been looking through a number of the pictures. She's got some interesting stuff. Looks pretty good. Um, she does. Yeah. So, yeah, the next one will make the um, the diary a little more uh, interactive as well. We'll try and get everybody using that. Because what I'm trying right. to build at the moment, and, and that's what I was saying before you joined, and for anybody else who wants to be able to, you know, in, in the chat and that, who wants to be able to get involved and help out, um, trying to build a, a couple of models machine learning models where you can upload a picture and it will tell you give you a you know it's confidence score and what it thinks might be wrong is it botrytis is it powdery mildew is it spider mite thrips etc et oh that's cool you know in sexing um trying to see how early you could sex a plant as well um and maybe even further down the line you know get into phenotype um forecast or prediction based on you know early photographs you know take I, I the beautiful thing would be if you could do the model at like four weeks um you know as in the plant's like four to six weeks old and you can get a good confidence score as to what the phenotypic expression might be so you know any breeders would find something like that pretty handy well not just them i mean anybody but the initial thing is to start with trying to do pest like ipm and nutrient uh, issues right no that that would definitely be a, a handy tool so any what i need to gather now is photographs and it's not well, i don't need that many i need i need around 300 of each thing but where it's um confirmed you know known truths that they the machine the, the machine learning algorithm needs to know that what it's looking at is exactly that so it needs you know all these pictures to be of botrytis and all of thrip damage and all of spider mite damage not is you know the problem with trying to source pictures online and is there so many of them are pictures of is this spider mite damage and i, I need it to be no this is yeah i need to have this you know known truths um richard d yeah i guess but like the, the the plant snap app i haven't seen it but i'm assuming it does something similar yeah um and really the idea was to see how quickly and easily something like this would be put together and it and offer it for that free. would be yeah that would be really cool to it would be definitely difficult like you said to make sure you get pictures that are definite Mm. especially with like spider mites because some of the damage can look one way and it may be spider mites and then it could be a deficiency you may not even have spider mites you know when you get those spotted weird leaves and exactly like yeah. sometimes sometimes you see those leaves and like i know when i see them i immediately think oh shit there's some spider mites underneath there until i flip it around usually i'm right or it's some kind of weird deficiency that showed up as a spotted leaf you know yeah no precisely and you know what's interesting <laughs> In the, in the model that I've been training up at the moment with 
only, I mean, less than a hundred pictures of um, each thing. And wow. the funny thing is the ones it struggles on where it'll come back and say, well, Padre Mildew, or it'll say spider mites. When you look at them, yeah, exactly, when you look at the pictures that it gets confused on, where the guess is like 52% powdery mildew, 48% spider mites. You look at it, and yeah, it's at that early enough stage where you could mistake it if you just glance at it, things yeah. that you, you would struggle with. So the idea That's is, what I was going to say. That, that spotted leaf is an earlier sign. You know, if you catch it then, you usually can fix it. But that's so early that, yeah, it could be numerous things. So that'll be kind of hard. Yeah. Um, but, and then the idea is, you know, using the, the data being captured from Peel Grow Systems is to combine that if you're using the platform and you say, okay, look, I've got a picture of this and it goes, okay, is it taken at this time? So it no, you know, the picture's time stamped. It can right. see from the history of the data that's been captured where the picture was taken, whether or not it's more likely to be um, uh, spider mites or a nutrient issue. Because as you say, it could be an early sign of something else. So the environment conditions are an indicator as to what could also be the cause. If it's Oh, definitely. I think, yeah. Yeah, the minder would help with that for sure and make it more of an accurate guess, I guess, you know? Yeah, and it's one of those... Um, you know, because if the environmental conditions are like, you'll never get uh, spider mites in those environmental conditions, and it can just rule that out altogether. Now it could be, um, right. you know, something else. You know, it just helps it um, narrow down what the official or potential problem is. You know, even if it, you know, for a new, like a newer grower, if they had one, you know, it would even be handy if it did give it two or three answers. It's better to have something narrowed down. At least you can work off those and kind of, you know, okay, I have these two answers. Well, it could be a deficiency or spider mites. And looking, if you don't see any mites, and you can kind of determine it's probably this, you know. Yeah. So even given two answers wouldn't be, at least in my mind, a bad thing. I would be fine with it because, like I said, I could, you know, at least narrow things down a lot easier. It doesn't necessarily have to be 100% correct, although it would be nice. But, you yeah. know, it wouldn't upset me if it was given two or three answers even. And it gives you a confidence score against each one of the answers so you know okay. it's most likely to be this um well however many categories you've trained the model to identify it splits the, the confidence score across those those categories um yeah i like that yeah so that's that's not that's not too far away actually it, it just needs the the input data and the other thing of course would be really intriguing is could you do phenotype and cultivar identification that would be really cool mm. but you need lots God, of photos difficult with no with no topping and no training you know you need the plants to just be grown straight out yeah let them do their thing because that's the way you get the true phenotype when i say the true phenotype you know the the natural phenotype being expressed if you start to train it you you, you know you're, you're stressing it in other ways and causing it to, to do things um, yeah you can definitely change just even you know the flower development mm -hmm. somewhat by training maybe tighter internodal spacing or whatever it may not do the same exact looking flowers as what it would have if it would have just done its thing and then one apically dominant you know flower or whatever it wanted to do depending on the type yeah, exactly. And I mean, you, you need it to show that, you know, the, the, the true, well, the, the true expression of the genotype in how it's structured, etc., which you're not going to get when you start topping it and doing other weird things with it. Right. Yeah, you're, you definitely could get into something else then. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, um... Yeah, so that's 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 the tricky one. <laughs> it's telling everybody, okay, I need lots of pictures, all of the same thing. But maybe on the next um, on the next operation, grow. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and if there's that anybody would... who's watching, by the way, who may be interested in taking part in the next Operation Grow, uh, get yeah, it. I think your microphone turned down. Whoop. Is that better? Is that better? No, you're still quiet. Go ahead. Is that better now? No, not really. Let me see if it's my... No, I'm all the way up. Oh, dear. I can hear you, but it's just quiet. Okay, let me just crank the gain up some more. What was this? I mean, there's probably a button on this damn thing that I was pressed. It's like when you sat back, something got hit, I think, because it immediately cut down the... Mm. Is that any better? No. Oh, one, two, three. There we go. Oh. Yeah, it's still quiet. Oh, let me... I'll switch over to the other mic quickly. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, how's that now? Man, you're so quiet. No? No? Better? Oh, it's weird. I wonder if anybody else is hearing it, too. Yeah. Um, I don't know. On, on the, just looking at the broadcast on, on the software, it looks like it's getting the volume pretty loud. So maybe it's yeah, just on... Like I said, people can hear. It's just quieter. Yeah. So, I mean, you can keep going. I can hear you. All right, I go medical saying it sounded okay. <laughs> it's a bit strange. <laughs> Dear audience, please let us know. <laughs> well, yeah, you get quick feedback. <laughs> I, I hear it very quiet, but you never know. It could be my my phone. I am on my older phone right now, so it could be. And with the weird delay, you're not quite sure at what point they're hearing you, you know, hearing us, which is what's strange. Um, I'm hearing you fine, so hopefully that's all cool. But yeah, yeah. so um, next question, the lights. Um, I've got oh, okay. the potential sponsorship for some lights, for at least probably cover two people. You can run 240, can't you? 220 yeah, to 240. Yeah, now. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, are those the CMH lights? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, those things were nice. I was I was checking those out. They're really nice looking light. I don't know if they're necessarily CMH, but uh, they probably have them in the range. Um, so if uh, six hundred watts is probably the best I could arrange. Getting you know, I don't don't know what the price tag is on these things. So. Um, is 600 yeah, watts I mean, satisfactory? I, yeah, I, I wouldn't probably run much higher than that anyway if it is a CMH or whatever. You know, I would stay in that 600 range tops. Mm, mm. Just because it'd be like, you know, running a two of the 315s or whatever. Yeah. Probably put that bad boy on a light mover or, or just sink it in the middle of a square and have it do its thing and get a nice even reading from out of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, if, you, if you follow their Instagram and if anybody who's watching, uh, we're talking about OCL, OCL Lighting, Dutch yeah, Lighting nice Company. Um, worth checking them out. They're doing a lot in Europe again. I don't know if they're necessarily a tune spectrum. I don't think it is, but their light fixtures and their grow tents are getting a lot of um, good coverage and good press. Um, pretty nice guys. That's good. Um, yeah, they had some really nice looking products on their website, so I, I couldn't see anything bad by the looks of them. Yeah, yeah they, it's interesting the wattage they have for sure. I saw that. Yeah, I, I'm actually thinking what we, the lighting companies, there needs to be a revolution in how lights are actually. Um, you know, the information printed on the side of those lights, the wattage means nothing. It really doesn't. It's only how much power it's drawing. It's got nothing right. to do with the output. And it's a real con. Um, um, yeah, especially with LEDs, it's terrible. I mean, they should give you, you know, I mean, sure, you want to be a new person coming in, it's even worse. Yeah, I mean, wattage is great, because you do need to know how much power the damn thing's going to draw so you don't blow, <laughs> you know, blow the circuits. <laughs> but, you know, you need wattage, 
you need par really um or what's the other one um lumens no, 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 no. not really looking not, not at lumens, lumens. Um, no, you're just naming what was on the box because they love to throw that one on there yeah so like a light bulb yeah you need wattage so you know how much power it's drawing you need something like par so you know how much usable light um um Um, how much usable light it's producing in the spectrums that you're interested in. I mean, that's really what you want because an HPS is producing usable light if you're interested in the infrared spectrum as well, you know, in, in, in that our IR spectrum. Um, but growers aren't necessarily that interested in it. So we're more interested in other parts of the spectrum and what lights that are more efficient in that space. And then your BTU, so you know how much heating it's producing. Yeah, Richard D is right. so U-moles, that was the other one. U-moles would be good, along with... Um, yeah, I mean, U-moles are very important. And you know, the wattage, at least for me, is important just because six months out of the year, I'm, I have to run, I have to run HIDs. I'd be screwed if I ran LEDs in the winter time. I, would, I wouldn't even be able to heat my tent, so... No, like I have to run, I have to run HIDs, so I'm looking at the wattage, not necessarily for the plants, but for me going, if I add that, is that going to be, you know, suffice for, for my tent? Because I know if I had a 315, it only adds two degrees to my tent. So well, I it's adding, but I mean, okay, it, well, uh, well this, this is the whole thing. Um, hold on. I, or I guess would, would lead into the BTUs, although they never list that shit, it seems like. Yeah, so but now the BTUs... You have to kind of go off the wattage. Let me share this with you, because I don't know if you've seen it on the... Um, I put up that little tool on the website, so... I put up a BTU calculator. Oh, where is it? God, I would be curious <laughs> to see what 315 um, is and... Oh, it's in in BTUs for sure. Like I said, that's the one light I have nailed down in uh, my tent. Yeah, I mean it's an insignificant amount. Hold on, let me quickly find this. Where is it going? There we go. Yeah, it's it's very little. Like you know, it, there's I always hear people that are on the fence about them. You know, do they put off heat? And some people be like, oh, they do put off heat, and, and they do. You know, yeah. they're a, a light bulb lamp, but it is really really a lot less than any you know any other uh, HID lights that there are that I've run. Mm. You know, the adding one to the tents really so negligible when I do. I mean, this is the argument. Okay, so it's 315 watts. Okay, now is that what it's... Okay, the next question is, is that what it's drawing from the wall or is it drawing more from the wall? Because let's say perfect um, circuit, no heat loss anywhere other than when it gets the light. You know, all the power gets distributed to the light. So pure 315 watts, which is... You know, a, a hypothetical scenario because it's never the case. Um, yeah, it'd be hard to say without measuring it for sure. I mean, I'd, I'd suspect it's pretty close to around there, but so far as the CMH ballast, I mean, I think a lot of them are rebuilt 400 watts. So I've always wondered, is it pushing 315 or is it pushing 400 watts? Well, you see this, you know, so the so. bulb is, well, this, so if the, if it's three. Yeah, it's probably actually, I mean, this is why you need to have measured at the, at the wall, because it's going to be 400 watts. And therefore, if the ballast is in the room as well... It's the 400 ballast, yeah. I mean, I, I, I could see it being 400. Yeah, so, yeah, then sure. let's err on the side of it being 400. So you're dealing with 400 watts, which is 1,000... Although I will say, if I plug in my 400 watt HPS, it's a hell of a lot hotter than my 315. So maybe it really is pulling in 315. Well, I mean, a, a lot of heat's a lot of heat, so... Yeah, but it's okay, on the calculator there, and if you can see it on your screen, um, or maybe on the shared screen, but, yeah, so if it's 400 watts, the BTU per hour is 1,364, 365, okay. rounded up. Now, that doesn't matter if it is HPS, LED, CMH... Makes right. no difference what's in that yeah, room, what a, light is. That's lot how much BTU be per hour it is producing. Um, there was a great video by this guy. I, I, I posted a link to it. I'll, I'll find it again, and I'll, I'll try and share it somewhere else as well so others can see it. But where they actually used a thermal camera against um, a tent that had... Um, 
an, a hid in it, an, an HPS and LED. And what was interesting when you looked at the thermal camera image of it from the outside was you could see all the heat was from the head was warming up the tent below it because that's all the infrared radiation pumping out and causing right. the surfaces to shooting heat that down. much quicker and it's shooting down because you've got the all um, reflector pointing down. I mean, if you just put the bulb in the middle of the room bare, it would do it in all directions. It would be even in that case. What you noticed with the LED is it was cooler all the way down, but the top of the tent was just as hot, if not hotter, than the HPS, because the HPS is heating up, dissipating quite a bit of the energy down the bottom, which then has to rise back up again. I mean, rise it's being up, absorbed yeah. by the surfaces. That's why they are warming up. Whereas with the LED, it's not warming the surfaces, but all that hot air is just rising straight up, and you see it all at the top of the tent. So Where the heat sinks are and everything, usually, that would make sense. So with an LED, what, you, what I would love to do as an experiment is to say, okay, everybody's saying, oh, you need to add heaters in the room, but that's because you're trying to introduce infrared radiation lower down. Um, if you just pump the... It, air from higher up just pumped it straight back down again you'd be bringing that warm air back down where it's not getting to normally from just the light if, that, if i'm if i'm right to save you some electricity cost for sure that's a great idea yeah huh so that yeah, I, don't, I, don't I don't know because the thing is people wouldn't do that yeah because see the thing is the um the hps is warming everything lower down but your LED isn't, and what you need to do is you just need to bring the hot air down, and then it will warm everything up for you. So, you know, that's the trick. Yeah, because um, it'll rise back up. You'll heat that upper part, you know, once it goes from the bottom to the top, which is why I like the, you know, HID in the winter time because it shoots it down and ends up, ends up heating the whole tent overall, but it's, you know, pushing that warm air down. So it's yeah. just... It's well, it's just, it's, a, and I still have to use heaters, it's not but so it's a much, lot less. Yes, yes. Um, but that would be that would be the trick. Mm. And I usually bust out a thousand watt HPS that I that I put on the light mover mm. in the winter time as a heater and as some extra light and everything. The harvests are always way better when that thing comes out. You know, they stack flowers, huge buds. If you got the CMH in there, you can still get the special profiles and trichome production and stuff like that if you're mixing spectrum so that's usually my heater along with the little radiant heater that i stick in the eight by eight usually is enough to keep it warm enough in the winter time but you know we get in like negative 10 20 30 sometimes so i mean you need a lot of heat sometimes to stay warm yeah yeah no, exactly. And then, of course, you've got the other problem is you've got that sudden tanking of humidity that comes with... Um, yeah, you better have something in there. That sudden drop in temperature like that. So now you've got to be pumping extra humidity into the into the space. Yeah, I know. When, when lights go off, I actually... A second heater ends up coming on. Because, yes, it, there's a huge drop. You know, even with the one heater on, but all them lights off... Yeah. Yeah, the, the temp can drop really fast really quick and uh go really really low you know so you gotta definitely keep up with it yeah i don't know if you saw that um that forecast chart that i put up it was it, that shows how you can see the plants the, the the pots in the environment were drying out and you see it like 24 hours before they suddenly fall off the cliff in the sense that the, <laughs> you, you, you can I've got, can you see it up on the screen there that around the 3rd of October oh, yeah. you know 2nd to 3rd you can see it's tracking it along tracking it along and then suddenly the it max dropped. humidity doesn't quite get there and on the 3rd it just plummets and you know that drop in humidity uh, let me see it doesn't show up on the screen. Um, the, just do one thing. 
so where it's um yeah this uh that's the plants slowing down their transpiration because they're realizing that they're drying out. And this is another aspect of VPD because this is VPD at the root level, um, they, where the plants are picking that up on, you know, the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It is kind of vapor pressure at, at, yeah, vapor pressure at the root level. It's realizing that that's changing, so it's slowing its transpiration down closing this to Marta and then you suddenly see it's like okay no it's not and when I had to, went to go and have a look yeah it was like whoa these are suddenly a hell of a lot drier than they than they would be um but it's a good sort of heads up yeah it tells you at least 24 hours before it's become a problem you know not quite an unrecoverable problem but not bad enough yeah yeah that's definitely helpful um, and um, it's getting better and better at predicting things. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it does too. You know, with with each minder, better and better in time as it learns your environment or whatever. Yeah, it's just learning my environment more and more over time. It, it's starting to get a repeat of seasons, so it's starting to see. Um, you know, that time of year is coming around again. It now starts to recognize patterns from last year and starts to build upon that. That's cool. Uh, along with... Yeah, I wouldn't have thought about it, remembering seasons and stuff. That's kind of cool. Mm. And then with this, this one combines external weather conditions. I've got another one that doesn't. Uh, and they interestingly forecast off from each other. Well, one, one really picks it up, the other one doesn't. Let me uh, flick over to that. It is amusing. To, uh, amusing, that's a bit geekily sad. <laughs> that's what this is all about. It's all about geeking out. All these presentation windows showing different things, it's trying to remember which window I'm actually looking at. Da, da, da. Come on. All right. So the one, oh, they're not too bad actually. Yeah. The one at the top is, the one that combines external weather conditions, the one at the bottom doesn't. That just looks at historically observed data. Gotcha. But the, for, the, weather, the general weather forecast is predicting around the 7th that it's going to be a little drier, and you can see that the one on the top here, it, it, it's dipping a little bit at that point, whereas, oddly enough, the one below is just showing it like a, a constant increase. It, it's slowly rising up here. So it is interesting to see it pick up on the weather and use that. Yeah, it's really cool. And this is for a sensor that's in the same space, the next chart is for a sensor in the same space that's maybe a half a meter away and it's completely different. Wow. Um, and bear in mind that blue line, so the, this blue line is the actual observed data. And it's a completely different profile to what you see just 50 centimeters to the right of it. And therefore anybody who doubts about putting multiple sensors in an environment, <clears throat> any sensor or environment monitoring company that tells you one sensor covers five square meters or five square feet. Absolute bullshit. I mean, an infrared sensor, yes, because it can have a visual footprint. But an ambient temperature and humidity sensor measures nothing more than the space it occupies. Sorry about that. My mic was uh, muted. 
No, 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 all good, all good. I was on a bit of a rant. I have a... <laughs> no, I was listening, I was listening. I just didn't realize I muted my mic. No, it's a, that forecasting is a really handy feature. Yeah, um, and at white point lighting, we actually do have um, Wi-Fi moisture sensors that are, that are coming out soon. Um, so yeah, no, and for that exact reason. But it's interesting that you can analyze environmental humidity, you know, just the humidity in the environment. You can, if you watch it long enough, you can learn the patterns and the trends in it and see, you know, that sudden pattern means that the plants have slowed down in their transpiration, which is, okay, what's the cause of the slowdown in transpiration? They're drying out. So, you know, if you, as, as a general tip to anyone, no matter what environment monitoring system you're using, if it's recording data and you can see it and you can see these trends, then, um, you know, you can use that as a guide if you're just looking at, oh, look, that humidity just tanked in that space. Let me go and have a look and see what's going on. Um, but yeah, no, we are bringing out ones that you can just stick into the, um, stick into the ground. I have mine going straight into the soil, but it's just doing the, uh, the temperature. <laughs> Not like moisture or anything. Yeah, it's just in the temperature one, yeah. I like that one though, it's cool. It's nice in the winter time when it's really cold to see where, where that root zone's gonna be at, because I've done some wild things to try to keep the, uh, the pots warm, you know, on the bottom, from buying heated blankets to cover the bottom of the floor of the tent to all sorts of weird shit, but... Yeah, and, and uh, this time of handy. year... And this time of year is particularly important to be keeping an eye on, um, on on that in particular because, you know, this is the time of year where you start pulling in all that cool air from outside. Um, and it can really impact the, the temperature of your pots. People don't oh, think absolutely. about it. Oh, uh, absolutely. I'm just trying to see. Oh, yeah. Grab enough data here quickly and see if I can show it with let me get rid of the dew point and the canopy temperature so yeah I mean that's the grow medium being measured and what's interesting is every time it dips <laughs> that when the room actually warms up and it starts pulling in all the cold air from outside. So there's, yeah, that drop there, that cool air coming in, lights turning off, it stops pulling in so much cool air. Um, and it warms back up again. Yep, and there's, my well, we got water, that was quite a steep drip. Dip. And again, if, for being able to keep an eye on, you know, what's the impact of irrigation? You know, if, if your water reservoir is cold, you'll see it. And that's exactly what happened here. Oh, yeah. That was it got watered with some cold water. <laughs> it's because I didn't nosedive. Um, yeah, you can watch the uh, that soil probe, the temperature dive when you water in. It's kind of cool, actually. Mm. And if, if you were using dripper, again, it's another one of those things. If you were using dripper systems on a timer or irrigation on a timer, you could look at your the charts if you were out and about and you wanted to, you know, did that happen? Did it irrigation cycle take place? You could look at the charts and you would be able to see a dip in the temperature if you had probes in the in the grow medium. Or yeah, if you just had you one in the grow could. medium somewhere, then you'd be able to pick it up from that. As, as a fail safe, you know, just as another backup. No, you're right. It, you definitely can tell when when you're watering in, so it would be another way just to just to know what's going on. Mm, mm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm taking a quick look through the general comments here. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, well, the rest of the grow crew is Cobb Grow. Where's, where's Mystic today? Misty. Let's see if we're going to join. Yeah, I'm surprised nobody else is on. They were all talking about it, so. 
Yeah. I mean, somebody would be on. <laughs> um, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, cob grower, that's not a bad idea. I mean, a volatile compound sniffer would be interesting. That yeah, would be awesome. Um, and strangely enough, it is something we've been asked about more than once. <laughs> You know, is there a way I could put something in so I could know if it was smelling outside the room or in the people were asked if they could stick it, some kind of sensor that they could put in the extraction ducting after the carbon filters to see, to make sure that what was going out was still clean. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll get there one day. Yeah. Well, the tech's moving at such a rate. Pe- pace that I'm absolutely sure it will be there one day. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking, especially in this industry, you know, we're into buying our specialized equipment and shit like that, so. Mm, mm. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. So any other general questions from the audience? Fire away. By the way, I'm surprised nobody took up the offer to jump in, dial in, dive in, have a chat. Um, so white lightning, white point lightning asking, how often do you water each plant a day when you water? Um, he's asking that directly to you there, Rich. And if there's a... Hmm, I mean, that's hard to say. I actually do water every single day and it's a little bit though. Because I have a nice super soil mix, so I like to keep it moist up top, but it's... I don't get, I usually don't do it for a bunch of runoff, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for enough for the, the plant to drink and everything in the soil to be wet and kind of be active and doing its thing. And I've noticed that's pretty much, you know, the best way for me that it works out. It can be a pain in the ass to be out there watering every day, but, you know, if you're not putting a ton of water through it, it's really not that bad. It's really hard to say though, I mean, for a five gallon pot, I usually fill up a gallon sprayer and probably divide that between four plants. And then as flowering, you know, progresses, they can get thirstier. So it definitely fluctuates. But I would say uh, the one gallon watering sprayer can, I can usually fill that thing up. It's usually a little bit more than a gallon, though, maybe a gallon and a quarter, a gallon and a half, and divide it up into four or five gallons, four or five gallon pots. And yeah. water that in nightly and like i said if you know you're not getting a ton of runoff i do like to every you know so often run some water through just to you know make sure there's no build up from a bunch of compost teas and all the microbials i'm adding which you know i'm sure is fine and not really ne- necessary but i like to do it anyway mm, mm. let's give it a good flush i think the plant appreciates a, a nice flushing of fresh clean water every now and then Yes, 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 yes. And it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the how long is a piece of string question, because as you say, how much do you water them? It also depends stage of growth. But you could water them, apart from I guess the really early, early stages, watering every day is not required, but as they oh, no. a little bit, depending on the pot size, you could maintain a water it every day regime. Um, yeah, I usually don't do the water at every day thing until I'm putting them into their final, like five gallon pots and, you know, which is right before flower or, you know, seven gallon, whatever I'm going into. And uh, I usually don't start doing it till then. I'm not doing it in one gallons or, you know, solo cups or anything that would just drown them. Mm, and they're mm. not really big enough to be sucking up that much water either. You know, I mean, when they're in a five or seven gallon and you're only adding a quarter of you know, a, a one gallon watering can to it. There's just not enough water for them to flood out, but it's a perfect amount to keep them through to the next day and keep them happy, you know, so. Yeah, I, I very rarely f- feed to runoff. Um, I don't either, it's yeah. very rare. I prefer just, to- just getting runoff in general for me, unless I'm, you know, the end of the cycle and just running water through to run it through and clear the soil out, you know, but. Mm. I mean, I prefer 
light feeding, very, I mean, I do much lighter than recommended, I guess, feed and just keep it regular. I mean, I don't have a break between watering and feeding, growing in soil. It's always just a very light feed continuously. And then maybe at the end of a, a growth cycle with the, the, the chilies, I'll only feed it water for a bit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's the um, that's the idea there, and that way you know it's just yeah it's just keep it going ticking over. I'm sure by the end of the growth cycle that soil is might as well treat it like a, <laughs> a cocoa. It's been, it's been so rinsed by the end of it. Goodness. Yeah, I know. Small pots, I know when bigger I... plants. The small plots, big. You can get decent sized plant in a small pot with great irregularity oh. of feeding. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I know people that grow in tiny pots, but they're feeding all the time. You know, but their plants look good and they're huge for the pot they're in. Mm, mm. You know, they're doing synthetics, but they they look great. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I mean, and that is part of the. Yeah, I guess the, the the draw with synthetics over say organic living soil is um, the size of the pot that you can use. Definitely. Just because you can cram so much more in. Well, you can cram the same amount in just in a smaller space. There we go. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well. I mean, I'm quite happy just to carry on talking shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm always good, so I'm, I'm fine. I don't know what the what what the audience feels like. Is there again, audience? Anything in particular? Anybody want to dive in, jump in? More than welcome to. I can put up get, the link uh, again. Maybe we can get some people to sign on to the next one if they want. You know. Yeah. Get some new get some new people in would be kind of cool too. Absolutely. Um, it's just always nice to see different growing styles, and, you know. Mm, mm. It's a very interesting, you know, concept or whatever with the show, I think. So it's it's fun to go along. It's not often you get to grow the same cultivar with 10 other people, you know. I mean, it's hard enough to get, get to do that with your friend, be like, hey, pop seeds at the same time I do, you know. It's very difficult just to have everybody match up, you know, their times and harvest times so you can pop seeds at the same time. And it's just, it's just really cool to do it with 10, 10 different people and it actually work out somewhat, you know. Yeah. And See the end product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, we still have to have a wrap up show of this, of this grow to try to get the last of everybody in. Um, Tenacity's working and it's proving a little bit tricky to get him nailed down with you know we need to have that final photo session the catwalk parade of of, of bud and a final re report and hopefully get badger on maybe for the final one and you know see if we can get some feedback and information that way which would be great um yeah basically, yeah that would be cool you know it's really nice to see is everybody growing it together so you can all ask questions, you know, who's seeing this, who's oh, seeing definitely. that. I um, really hope that uh, Kind of Queen will, you know, she is going to be more engaging to have them on to ask them those questions as well. Um, yeah, that that's cool. I'm, I'm uh, excited for that part, like her joining in and, and wanting to be a part of it is going to be cool, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, matching up phenos with other people and stuff, that's been exciting too, to be like, who's getting this pheno? And then see the one pheno that everybody's getting and, mm, mm. you know. I mean, I don't know what kind just, of photo diary people kept for, for this run. Um, but I think that, again, again, you know, that another interesting little experiment to try out, you know, if everybody on the next run is all growing the same and if people are all dedicated enough to do it where the photos are kept categorized as per plant these all these photos are plant one plant two plant three etc along with the uh, the grow journal and everything that that's capturing then 
that's going to be interesting to see if we can spot the similar phenotype out of everything or identify the different phenos and have it, you know, have the computer ML model see if it can categorize the various phenotypes. Um, right. Or within a single cultivar. That would be quite tricky. But interesting to see if it could be done. <laughs> um, no, it is. It's very interesting. It's a, a fun... Fun little thing to do, for sure. Wow. So, Cobb Grow must have got, what, 314 grams from their harvest. Very nice. Nice. 130 That's grams of trim. That's not a bad... Well, yeah, so that was trim off the buds, I'm assuming. Um, sugar. I'm assuming that's usable trim, not throwaway uh, trim. So that's not a bad ratio. Right. Not too bad at all. Yeah, not bad. It's always nice to get anything, you know, and walk <laughs> yeah. away with walk away with the harvest and, you know, not lose everything. I always go into it thinking, telling myself it's not gonna be successful. So when it is, I'm happy with myself instead of thinking, oh, this has to be nailed this run, you know, because then if something happens then you're all upset. So Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just it, man. Um yeah, he's like, not that I would know. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically <yeah>. speaking, <laughs> if I was. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. So, Cobb Grow, where is the ask it. Is that Mystic, you said? Well, her other half, Cobb Grow, is in the chat, gotcha. so... Oh yeah, that's right. They do have the Jack here. I've been following that too. That if that's them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, three hundred and fourteen. What is a pound? Like four, four hundred and something grams. That sounds pretty close to probably what I got because I was thinking close to about a pound probably from the six. Ah, uh, she's working. She's always working, doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Busy girl. <laughs> yeah. Um. Busy, busy. That's good, though. Well, she'll be involved in the next one, so that's cool. Um, I know she'll definitely be in that. So I think awesome. confirmed from this run, we've definitely got four or five people. Let's say four or five. Because I think um, Dr. Wigler wants to take part in the next one as well because he was keen to be like more involved in the journal side of things. And I know Underground wants cool. to. Um, there's yourself. There's Mystic. So that's four at least. And then one other definitely, I'm sure. That, um, there will be... Um, we'll bring it up to five. So anybody in chat and anybody who watches this between the... Well, we're on the 5th of October and the 14th of October. Message me directly either, you know, on, on YouTube um, or find us on Instagram at peelgrow.systems and message us there. Entry into yeah. Operation Grow is just a cost of the minder. We do them discounted at 25% for taking part. Um, you get the seeds as well, and you just need to partake on weekly shows. That's really it. You don't have to be there every week, but you need to attend a number of them and document and be, you know, be active and be involved. Yeah, I think with the next one, if you are able to get two of those lights and two people, two people can get them, it would be very interesting to see two people grow the same one under the same lighting, just in a different room. Mm, and see mm. what kind of expressions those two people are getting along with the other group, you know? I think that would be very, very, very interesting, you know? Not just saying that because I would love to run one of the lights, even if I didn't get picked. It would still be really cool to see two people running the exact same shit in a different room, you know? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to get it to the point where we can actually do that, where we can have multiple people running the same 
cutting or whatever, so, like you were saying. Yeah, either everybody running the same cut, but also everybody, or, or you know, then everybody running the same lighting gear, same irrigation system, but maybe just swapping up. Well, if we're all running the same cut, then you know, you can swap out the nutrients, and everybody's just running different nutrients, for instance, or same lights but different irrigation solutions, and see which one you know put up. You know the DWC against uh, flood and drain against you know your standard hand watering or whatever it happens to be. Um, that'd be cool. It would be just to see. You know, I'm very interested to see how how phenotypes are expressed, and it seems like different lighting is causing a lot different looks. You know, to flowers, at least from what I'm seeing. Yeah. So it's 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 an interesting subject to me. Hang on, let me just quickly, uh... Uh, I can't fucking type. Yeah, so... Uh, at Sleepy... The breeder of... Bob Sled was Badger's Dank. Oh yeah, he's already answered. Bum, 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 sorry. Bum. Yeah, they were testers, so... Yeah, you know it happened. It happens with testers. That's why they're test. You know, in the testing phase is to weed Precisely. stuff out like that, and it's really useful for him because it's ten people, and when everybody's just about everybody's getting hermy, it's easy to say, oh well, this isn't somebody with a light leak or whatever. This is definitely got to be something genetic, you know. Yeah, and I we mean, can also every grower can produce some degree of environmental data to go with it. Say, well, look, this is how it was grown. So right. you can see in these conditions, at least this is what it's doing. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And and when I started seeing two or three, and then I found some, you know, people, two or three people saying that they were finding them, it was like, okay, mm. you know, and then I found a couple seeds in mine. That's when I was like, this has got to be genetic because there's no way that everybody, I mean, it's possible, I guess, but to me, it just seems like, you know, it would have to be, so. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is why I'm going to make sure that on the next run as well with Canna Queen and anybody else who, you know, and, and any of the next ones that we do, it's just known as batch A, batch B, batch C. No actual what the final name of this thing might be. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Because too. what I don't want happening is somebody who... Well, you know, I'd like to think from the seed breeder side, what I don't want happening is, you know, like, let's say in a scenario where it, it, it hermes, like, all over the bloody show, that, you know, like, this, maybe this, is, we went too long, because you, your plants can hermes as well if you just flower them oh, out yeah. for too long. They'll start to do it, because they're just desperate to reproduce. I mean, almost oh, anything, if you leave for long enough, will do it. But... I don't want somebody it's, watching this seeing oh badges dank and going oh not badges dank um Jamaican bobsled oh that Hermes when he's now reworked the line further to bring you know to make it more stable based exactly. off the feedback from this and then he's released Jamaican bobsled in a year's time or something like that that's rock stable but somebody sees Agreed. this big and that's why I don't want names involved because it's not fair and also the other one being if there's suddenly some fire pheno that comes out of it nobody will know what it's called so you can't say i yeah. have a cut of this you just have batch a and the fuck it is <laughs> yeah and you know there is there's some really really nice cuts in that jamaican bobsled and it does seem like from the ones that did get a herm or have found them i haven't seen everybody's pictures but it seems like it may even be a specific pheno or a specific pheno type you know two one or two yeah. So, I mean, it's possible, I guess, it could be reworked, you know? So, I understand that totally. I mean, it, it has some really good phenos in there. And, you know, it is a tester, mm -hmm. exactly. So, you can't get upset about something happening with the, with the tester, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was exactly it. I mean, it was known he to He got be, some uh, useful data, and so did we out of it. So, can't complain. Yeah, yeah. And then the next one, it, yeah, it'll, it'll be better. Just to right. say, yeah, we just got to figure out. We need everybody to canvas him to say he needs to jump on. <laughs> For at least one. Uh, we get there in the, in, in, in the end. Um, but I, I yes. think that's what's missing. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead. I think that's what's missing from the in the industry is a you know that kind of proper blind testing. Just bringing some of that to to the program, yeah, you know, just to make it a little bit more legit. Right. But again, all this undocumented strain information. Oh. I'm not I'm not OCD, but that really winds me up trying to do anything with it because it's like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> it's an absolute <laughs> shit fest. You know, it, it's just crapshoots when people are doing breeding. It really is. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that, again, yeah, I'd interesting to see what we could do there how programs like this just raise some of the some, some awareness on the problem yeah it, it's there's a lot of good a lot of good information on this show for sure i mean between the 10 of us and mm. you and whoever you know yeah we need to um i'm just going to figure out what's going to be the best day for it because during the week it's the time zone thing that's the absolute kicker. Because, yeah, sure, if I stayed up till 2 a.m., it would be fine midweek, you know. But... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is hard, you know. Like, for me, I I basically have to sit around till 3 in the afternoon. And then for you, it's the end of the night. And, you know, a couple other people, it's noon for them or, you know, 1. So it is a weird, mm, mm. weird thing with the time zone sometimes for people, I guess. You know, I understand that. Yeah. You know, that's where I was trying to think, you know, does Saturday, does a weekend work better? I can, that's one of the cats throwing shit around in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> well, at least I hope it's one of the cats. If anybody sees somebody sneaking up behind me in the camera, do do give me a heads up. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> um, the, oh, fuck, what was I saying? Oh, my brain's gone to shit. Um... Yeah, that totally threw me off. I can't remember what the fuck I was talking about. Uh, oh, yeah, what day of the week, weekends and that, you know, Saturday, Sunday, does that work better during the week? The problem being that people are at work. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, like I said, every day is the same with working for myself, you know. Saturday could be as busy as Monday, so... Yeah. And, and, you know, I might be dead, so it, it really doesn't matter to me. It's whatever, I guess, for everybody else is more feasible for them. Cause mm. I definitely mm. wouldn't want to have to work people around my schedule, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And it was a little bit of an exercise in herding cats, but we're getting better at it. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, by the end of it, we'll be professional cat herders. Professional cat herders. <laughs> Yeah, I, I happen to just to see the, the discussion around terps and that. Um, say a cousin friend I may know is going out this uh, pineapple wine um, of Ari Genetics. I know. Yeah, the I, pineapple wine. I don't know if you've ever grown it. Um, I have but, not. I was trying to, they were asking for some assistance in trying to identify what the terpene smelled like. And I, I, in the end, I think it smelled like PVA glue is kind of what I got after thinking huh. about it. <laughs> it was a bit strange, um, but totally different to anything I have smelled over here, at least. Um, it, 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 it's quite bizarre. I do like that all the, the weird and wonderful different aromas that come off the same bloody thing. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, yeah, I'm just wondering if I should do the most ridiculous thing. The uh, problem is putting your email address in the chat is not a smart thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I guess not, maybe. Unless it's a, you know... 
an maybe, extra email or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can I have put probably it, like five. Yeah, I just want to do it for those who, you know, anybody who wanted to. Actually, I tell you what. Um, if you're wanting to be involved in the next Operation Grow, then you need to follow. I'm going to put it up here at Operation Grow. Um, oh, for fact's sake, it's going to. Given that that's the name of the channel when I try and put it into the bloody chat, it's, it's screwing it up. Um, let's see if we just say fire at version grow 2019. Ah, oh, there we go. That stop it doing it. So I think that's what I had to call it, wasn't it? I think it's operation grow 2019. The account. Yes. Da, da, da. Operation grow. Yeah, it would definitely be nice to see a few new one, new people join. There we go. All right, so it's still fucked it up. I decided to put a space in between Operation Go and 2019. I think you got it right. Yeah, does it look okay? Yeah, I know that's when I type it, that's how it comes up, no spaces or anything. For Instagram, yeah, that that's the Instagram one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's it. I'm sure people will find it without a problem. Alrighty, I tell you what. It's been a great chat. Thanks everybody who... Uh, been who joined chatting. in. Who joined Thank in. You. Yeah, in the conversation there. Absolutely fantastic. Um, look, I think next week it's going to be on Saturday again. Uh, I'll try and write more people in. Um, during the week it's just proving, well, at least Thursday is, is not convenient. Um, my daughter has started volleyball again, so I'm doing dad's taxi service to and from volleyball uh, on Thursday nights, <laughs> which is the problem. Um, so yeah, the show start time really cool. on Thursdays is my pickup time for my son too, so it's been yeah, hard yeah. on that day. Yeah, School's yeah. School yeah. starting. Exactly, exactly. So um, I think there'll be a Saturday again for next week. So everybody's watching, tune in again next week. It'll be absolutely great. Um, yeah. See you all then. Yeah, have a good weekend, everybody.